In 1855, a treaty between Indian leaders and U.S. officials created the Flathead Indian Reservation in what is now the northwestern corner of the state of Montana. For the native people, the treaty represented a promise of peace and a guarantee that they would be able to continue to live by their traditional tribal ways. But throughout the 19th century, U.S. officials consistently sought to weaken the treaty, to avoid meeting its obligations, and to undermine rather than defend the independence of the native peoples. Nevertheless, the Kootenai, Ponderay, and Salish or Flathead tribes managed for 50 years to exert a measure of control over the changes that were imposed upon their people and their lands. The Flathead Allotment Act of 1904, however, tipped the balance. Authored by Montana Congressman Joseph Dixon, the act broke the back of the independent tribal economy. As time passed, the non-Indian even became aggressive over the existence of the reservation and the fact they would look up and say, you know, look at all that wonderful farming land and here's all these Indians up here and they don't know what to do with it. And so there became a, a movement, an attitude of the settlers that uh, that's an awful waste of land. We should be getting that reservation. It should be opened for settlement so some good use could be made of the land. The Flathead Allotment Act was the local version of a national law, the General Allotment Act, which was passed in 1887. Congress unilaterally imposed this act on many Indian reservations across the continent. In 1904, Republican Representative Joseph Dixon, a Missoula businessman, pushed the bill through Congress. The Hellgate Treaty of 1855 allowed individual tribal members to request allotments of land, but did not allow for allotment to be imposed upon them by the government. Despite the treaty's language, and despite overwhelming opposition among tribal members, Dixon found a legal loophole and got the bill passed. The result was that communal ownership of the land, the basis of the tribal economic system, would be brought to an end. The Indian agent on the reservation would lot individual tracts to individual people. The rest of the land on the reservation, much of the best land, was declared surplus by the U.S. government and actually thrown open to settlement by white homesteaders. <laughs> They call it making checkers, meaning that they start up cutting the reservations. In May of 1910, the gates were opened and non-Indians steadily began taking homesteads across the Flathead Reservation. Well, they did no more than open the reservation. And boy, you talk about, about the immigrants coming in. Horse, horse and wagon, buggies, some pack horses. Uh, you'd go out to Charlotte, Nat Country horseback, and when you'd be coming home late in the evening, hell, maybe the road you, the trail you took going out, when you come back, you couldn't go on it. That'd be a 
wire fence in a shack there and be a homesteader pulled in there and to set up his homestead outfit. Well, the, in uh, the lands where uh, the, the wild food grow, you see uh, those lands were uh, the, sold to the whites by the government. That is what they homesteaded there. And of course, if, I, if uh, Indians went up there, they'd say, could we pick uh, some of the uh, fruits which are in your uh, country or in your land? If the man was uh, mean, he'd say, you go to hell, get it elsewhere. And this is private property. But if the man was uh, kind enough, then he'd say, yeah, yeah, go ahead. And then they'd dig. And then after a while, the, wherever the wild food grew, then uh, it was plowed up. That, then that would uh, kill off those uh, wild food. It would, there'd be no, none left. You know, I always said that was the worst thing they ever done was when they saw this reservation open. The Indian people of the Flathead Reservation were unaccustomed to both farming and private property, and they became easy targets for those whites who had long coveted their land. With the aid of U.S. Indian agents who were either negligent or corrupt, much of the good farm acreage was quickly taken over by the old licensed Indian traders and a new group of white land dealers. That's government. That is job. We've got no more land. That time we got land, we couldn't go any place but uh, put the camp in the place. Now government give us land eight acres, we grab it. We're crazy. Come to the concept of ownership of land, it was something new to the Indian. Whereas with the European, that ownership concept is well embedded in their society. So. As they came in contact with the Indian, they were well practiced in the ways of getting land, claiming land, and holding it. And the Indian was not prepared for this. So we got nothing, we got no plow, anything. You will sell your land, tomato, tomato, makinus, eight acres, just like that. No more land. The Allotment Act might not have destroyed the tribal economic system by itself. But in 1908, soon after the passage of the allotment bills, Congressman Dixon pushed through another measure to construct a massive irrigation system on the reservation. The Flathead Irrigation Project would bring water to 150,000 acres of dry lands. The official rationale was that the project would help Indians become farmers. Um, the irrigation project was originally designed to benefit Indians and to serve Indian allotments. Uh, but when the reservation was opened, many non-Indians acquired the allotments, and so in the early years you had a BIA um, authorized projects serving non-Indians on the reservation. During the initial construction of the irrigation project, the materials used to build the ditches were purchased at Missoula Mercantile and Beckwith Mercantile in St. Ignatius. Joe Dixon, who produced the legislation to open the reservation, had an interest in the Missoula Mercantile. He also owned property on the Flathead Reservation. Um, it was like a comedy of errors because Beckwith ended up acquiring many of the Indian allotments for an $80 debt at the store. In addition, they acquired allotments 
through uh, foreclosure where tribal members owed the irrigation project for water delivered. With control of the reservation quickly slipping away, at least some tribal people took up active resistance to the construction of the flatted irrigation project. <laughs> The irrigation project would profoundly change the natural water tables of the valley, ruining Indian gardens and devastating the fisheries. In effect, if not in intention, the project was part of the destruction of the economic and cultural independence of the people. On well, Mission Creek right here is a good example. You go down there now, and when I was a young fella here, they were all long up and down here. They were swimming holes for any kid that wanted. Now you'd have a hell of a time finding the swimming hole. And I used to catch a lot of nice big fish out of here. I know before the canals were put in, God, you could put a garden out there and you didn't need the water, but when they put the canals in, it kind of shut off. The traditional Indian economy of gift giving, of communal hunting and gathering, of yearly cycles of life, centered around a rich spiritual calendar. These ways continued to be practiced. But they were being displaced as a dominant way of life by a very different order. Indian people were increasingly made to feel like second-class citizens within their own sovereign homeland. Uh, my grandparents, my parents always felt that they didn't belong in certain parts of, of town. When in reality, this was their land. This was their home first before anybody's. They are not the visitors. They are the residents of this area but they were made to feel like visitors. In 1934, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed into law the Indian Reorganization Act, the IRA, which finally put an end to the General Allotment Act. But the allotment had already done its damage. Between 1887 and 1934, native-controlled lands within the United States were reduced by 65%. On the Flathead Reservation, the vast majority of the best agricultural and commercial lands were taken over by non-Indians. By the early 1930s, the economic, political, and social power of the tribes here had reached a low ebb. In 1935, however, we became the first tribe in the nation to reconstitute ourselves under the terms of the IRA. It was not a wholly positive change. The new tribal constitution phased out traditional chiefs and in some ways marginalized the more culturally traditional parts of the community. But it did provide the tribes, now officially the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes, with a new tool, a framework to defend our rights and rebuild our sovereignty. In 1971, the U.S. Court of Indian Claims, ruling in favor of the tribes, declared the Flathead Allotment Act a breach of the Hellgate Treaty. Today, the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes are working hard to regain our land base and also to revitalize the Salish, Pondere, and Kootenai languages and ways of life. The centennial of 1910 on the Flathead Reservation 
offers an opportunity to reflect on the meaning of our shared history and to chart a more just and mutually respectful future. Through all of this, all the loss of land, all the loss of language and our culture, we have managed to survive. We have managed to maintain and to hold on to the traditional values that have been passed down from generation to generation. We must maintain and hold on to those values. We must pass on what we know, what we have to future generations. We must protect our environment. We must protect the animals, the water, the pristine environment that we live in. Things that were passed on to us from our ancestors that guaranteed our lives today. We must in turn do the same thing, protect and pass on to future generations. So we can guarantee that the future generations have the same opportunity as we had in protecting what we have, the traditional values.